South Wales, a typical Australian country town. Quiet, unassuming, everyone going about their lives without making a fuss. That is, until the outsiders come to this part of the world, particularly during wartime. And whether they're Japanese prisoners of war or immigrants or strolling players, they've all created a big hoo-ha. None more so than a very famous World War I general who got the elite of Bathurst really excited and then snubbed them. Who was he? I'll give you a clue. He had a severe face, a big moustache, and he said, your country needs you. My orders have come through and I've been posted to the New South Wales town of Bathurst. Come on, join in the march. I'll requisition some recruits to recreate a famous recruiting march. What were they shouting? <laughs> Get to the heart of an extraordinary story of reconciliation. The key word that I've always concentrated on is understanding. And the happy return of the day at the road show. We now return this water bottle to Jennifer. Thank you very much. Drive about three hours west of Sydney and you'll find Bathurst, Australia's oldest inland town. Scratch its colonial history and you'll find agriculture and gold. But in the last hundred years, this region has always answered the nation's call to arms, proudly offering its people, its land and its resources. It's a nice, quiet country town day here today, but back in the year 1910, the whole of Bathurst was a buzz because it was about to receive a very distinguished visitor all the way from England. Lord Kitchener, that's right, the one with the big moustache and the poster with the pointy finger. But what was Kitchener doing here? The great man had been invited down under to cast his expert eye over Australia and New Zealand's fighting capabilities. Even in 1910, Britain regarded war with Germany as a matter of when, not if. Now, it so happens that Bathurst had just got this lovely new Boer War Memorial, and who better to open it than the hero of the Boer War himself, Lord Kitchener. So Bathurst decided to lay it on really thick. There was going to be a posh reception with speeches and loyal toasts and anthems, and that's where things got a bit tricky. And so began one of Bathurst's most famous urban myths. So, Robin, it's the big day, all the dignitaries are right here, but it didn't quite work out in the way they'd planned it, did it? No, it didn't. Um, on the way up, on tr by train, uh, Kitchener received a telegram which set out the program for the day, and he took a look at the program and saw that there was going to be a sort of a social function after the unveiling in the park where he'd meet more dignitaries of Bathers and particularly would meet their wives and daughters. He took a look at that and he said to the Bathurst representative, I'm a soldier, I'm not going to do that. So he rewrote the program on the train coming up from Lithgow. And he told this Bathurst dignitary, I'll give you five minutes on our arrival, you'll have five clear minutes for you to go and rearrange things. So Kitchener's down the railway station, he inspects the cadets and then he proceeds, open carriage, in a very leisurely pace for the extra five minutes to come up here to do the unveiling. So there must have been a lull in the proceedings. Well, not only a lull, but there's a lot of kerfuffle going on. Yeah. Something's happening, things are not quite right. But yes, he comes, and indeed, he unveils. He gives a very fine little speech. He then retires to his railway carriage. And that's when rumours started to spread about his bizarre behaviour. Well, the rumours started and the rumours persist to this day. And it all has to do with the name of Peter Hancock. Peter Hancock and Breaker Morant became part of Australian folklore in 1902 when they were executed for shooting Boer War prisoners. 
despite their claim that they were acting on verbal orders from Chief of Staff Kitchener's office. Not only was the execution order signed by Kitchener, it was done without the knowledge or consent of the Australian government, adding fuel to the anti-Empire fire. And so the whispers began. Have you heard? The great man objects. If Hancock's name isn't removed, he won't open the memorial. Well, one look at the original honour roll tells me that it's a casting, so it would be impossible to remove Hancock's name without anyone knowing. So obviously, it was never there to begin with. I find that extraordinary. I can see why during the time when Breaker Morant's story was so controversial that the rumour would have continued, but it was a long time ago, wasn't it? It was a long time ago, but I think back in 1910, the local dignitaries in Bathurst were very embarrassed by what had happened that day, where Kitchener was reluctant to meet their wives and daughters. So it's rather than admit that he snubbed their wives and daughters, they said they made a big fuss about the uh, role of honor. I think they were quite happy to let that rumor flourish. Still, it is a rather beautiful statue, isn't it? There's a, a grandeur about it. Would you say it's a fine bronze casting? Well, I would, yeah. It's uh, made out of plastic. You're joking! No, uh, well, it can't have been made out of plastic originally. No, it wasn't, but the youth of Bathurst were persisting in swinging off the rifle barrel and breaking it off, so it was felt necessary for the sake of the statue, the original, to remove it to the RSL Club, where you can see it today. And that is a plastic resin copy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for telling me that. Okay. Don't tell anyone about the plastic statue. Hancock's name was eventually added in the 1960s, along with several others which had been apparently overlooked. My next destination is just over 100 kilometres away, but it's a journey I simply have to make. My tour of duty wouldn't be complete without a visit to the small town of Cowra. Virtually every Australian knows something about the dreadful events at Cowra Prisoner of War Camp in August 1944. And this is where it took place. These days, it's home to mobs of wild roos. But back then, it was home to a huge number of Italian prisoners, plus Javanese, Koreans and Chinese. But when the Japanese arrived, they were a completely different kettle of fish. They were ashamed at having been captured. They were ashamed of being prisoners. Indeed, they felt they cast such a humiliation over their families that back in Japan, their daughters and sisters wouldn't be able to marry. Their dads would lose their businesses. Their whole family would be ejected from the village. This was the ultimate humiliation. And the only way to escape from it was to die fighting. And what better way to do that than to orchestrate a mass breakout and force the Australian army to shoot them? At 2 a.m. Saturday, August the 5th, all hell broke loose. About 2,000 prisoners armed with makeshift weapons stormed the barbed wire fences. Huts were set ablaze. Sentries opened fire. Three Australians died, but 231 Japanese POWs had achieved their suicidal goal. But look at these rolling hills. They were now full of escaped Japanese prisoners who'd failed in their objective of getting themselves slaughtered and were now wandering around the countryside. Did they still want to die? Did they want to go on the attack? And what about the people who lived and worked here? Were they terrified? Were they sitting at home with their guns on their knees? And what on earth were they supposed to do if they found one of these Japanese prisoners? I'm hoping to find the answer to that question about 10 kilometers out of town at a property called Rosedale. Hi, Bruce. How are you, Tony? All right, thanks for agreeing to see me. I'm meeting the owner, Bruce Weir. How old were you when the breakout occurred? I was 16. And you were living on this property? Yes, I've lived here all my life. So uh, 
When the breakout occurred, how soon after it were you aware that something untoward had happened? The next morning, my father and I left early to move some sheep up towards the railway line. My mother and my sister were at the house. About 20 past nine, I think it was, three Japanese soldiers approached Stan Bradkey, a man who worked here at the time, indicating that they were hungry and like something to eat. So he took them over to the house and he said, Mrs. Weaver, we've got three visitors. I think they'd like something to eat. She just said simply, all right, Stan, sit them on the side veranda there. I've got some scones in the oven. They won't be long. So your mum treated them with courtesy? Absolutely. And then what happened? Well, um, Margaret and my mother noticed that they had um, files and knives protruding from the pocket of their tunics. One of them was even wearing an old felt hat that belonged to my father. So we knew that those items came from the shearing shed. When they took their guns to the shearing shed, 16-year-old Bruce and his dad came face to face with a fourth POW with deadly intentions. He found a, a length of rope, had a noose tied around his neck and was trying to hang himself from a rafters. When we arrived, he rushed out the, the door past my father. He didn't keep running away. He just got outside and turned around and faced us. And then he withdrew one hand from behind his back and indicated to his chest, inviting my father and I to shoot him. And of course, that wasn't on the agenda. He eventually settled down and he walked back to the house between my father and I, shoulder to shoulder. A, a typical dad's army um, scene, I suggest. <laughs> you describe it as though it's still in the forefront of your Oh mind. dear, oh dear, it's just as if it happened yesterday. Yes. Uh, you don't he... forget experiences like oh, that. I'm not surprised. Did he just wander off or was he arrested? Why no, he, uh, he came back to the house and he sat down on his haunches and he just waited there until the military came and picked him up. Incredibly, seven freezing nights later, another two POWs were found on the Weir's property. This photo taken not long after shows one of them drinking from a mug, courtesy of May Weir. They had to come back past the house, and when my mother heard of their plight, she insisted she give them uh, another helping of the ubiquitous scones and tea. <laughs> Looking back, how do you feel about those guys? I think the story exemplifies the futility of conflict. I think it exemplifies the fact that human beings basically are all the same insofar as their needs and wants are concerned. Um, where we differ is in ideology. And uh, the key word that I've always concentrated on is understanding. Thanks a lot. Thank Goodbye, you. Tony. I hope I've been of assistance. You Thank certainly you. have. It took nine days and one more Australian life before all the Japanese POWs were rounded up. Seventy years on, Kaura still preserves the memory of that fateful day. In the aftermath of the breakout, it was, of course, thought right and proper that the four Australian soldiers who died should be remembered here in Cowra. And these are their gravestones. You can see how Ralph Jones here got the George Cross, and next to him, Ben Hardy got the George Cross as well. That's one of the highest medals for valour that you can get. But this section is only one half of the war cemetery. Right adjacent to it is this, another 523 graves, all of which are Japanese. Lawrence, why was this part of the cemetery created? Well, Tony, what happened was, of course, immediately after the breakout, there was 231 dead Japanese. So they buried them here, adjacent to the Kaura General Cemetery. So is it just the men who were involved in the Kaura breakout who were buried here? Originally, yes, in that section of the cemetery. 
But in 1964, a decision was made to get all the Japanese people who died in Australia during World War II and bring them to the one area, the one cemetery here in Australia. And that included civilian internees and then later still the air crews who were shot down over Darwin. When it was opened, it became the only Japanese military cemetery in the world outside of Japan itself. It's a fascinating change in attitude towards the Japanese who fought in the Second Absolutely. World War. Absolutely. The Japanese were so hated during the Second World War, but what happened was, and I think because of some of the things that happened here in Kara, people who fought against the Japanese came to Kara, realised that they had the responsibility of looking after those graves and took it on themselves to begin the job of reconciliation simply by doing what they have said in the past was the right thing to do. It's a lovely story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. And to think, the spirit of reconciliation that still burns brightly in Kara today started with a kind-hearted farmer's wife, a cup of tea and a plate of scones. My tour of duty to delve into a hundred years of war service and find out what memorabilia Australia stashed away in the attic has taken me to central west New South Wales. Something really significant happened here in 1918, which I want to share with today's citizens of Cowra. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, have any of you ever heard of the Gallipoli Strollers? Never. No? no? They're legendary, man. These, this is the end of the First World War, OK? Uh, and they were a team of strolling players, vaudeville artists, and they'd all been soldiers. They'd all fought at Gallipoli, actually. Wow. Well, they were at Gallipoli, and it's hard to believe, given what we know about Gallipoli, they used to work up little skits, little comedy acts in the trenches. And then, when they'd finished fighting, they came back here and thought, time to earn a living. And so they started wandering round Australia doing shows for people. Why am I telling you this? Well, part of the reason that we know about them is because they came right here, Monday the 4th of November 1918. And we know that because of a review in the, the Cowra Free Press. It says, uh, the Gallipoli Strollers uh, made their second appearance here and were given a most cordial reception. Perhaps the most pleasing features were a series of musical monologues by Private Harley Cohen. This is interesting. Private Cohen's efforts were realistic by reason of the fact that he detailed his own exciting experience in battle instead of something fictional that occurred perhaps in the time of Napoleon. So you can imagine what kind of show it was, kind of. Very the, moving. Yeah, it, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, there would have been lots of knockabout bits in it, but then suddenly this guy would come forward and say, I actually fought at Gallipoli, and here's a song about what it would be like. It says here, Grotesque character impersonations were supplied by Corporal Thor Clyde and Private Hector Gray. What do you think a grotesque character impersonation is? Give us one. Oh, Winston Churchill, I'd rule the Navy and Australian <laughs> troops are terribly undisciplined. <laughs> <laughs> it just flowed out, that one, didn't it? Can you give me one? The food was terrible and I suffered. Oh, <laughs> can you do one? Oh! Oh, oh, oh all together now. Oh. They were certainly grotesque character impersonations. But that bloke that I told you about earlier, Harley Cohen, I just think that he is really interesting. Look, it says here at the bottom of his photo, sincerely yours, Private Harley Cohen, wounded Lone Pine, 1915, Gallipoli. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it says, I would like to say that Dr. Sheldon's new discovery has been better for me even than my luck. I escaped the severe cold some of my comrades had because of my habit of taking a sip of new discovery every day. He was doing ads. What a task. Logging cough medicine. Yeah, no Australian would do that now. Well, no, unless you're in the Australian cricket side. Exactly. <laughs> he was the Shane Warne of his generation. <laughs> nice to see you anyway. You. Oh, by the way, this Sunday in Bathurst, we've got a big community day, midday. Do come and join us. Oh, see, you okay. <laughs> see you. Bye. Speaking of Bathurst, I'd better get my skates on. This is a beautiful part of Australia, 
but time's short and I've got migrants to meet, larrikin ladies to discover and houses to visit. This is Busby Street, typical little street in an Australian country town. Lots of pretty little houses, probably built in the first part of the 20th century, almost identical. This one, though, is very special. It's special because in it lived one of Bathurst's favourite sons. Although I'm not going to tell you who that was yet, because I've got something else to show you first. Hi, Sam. Hello, Tony. Thanks for the tea. That's OK. Look, this is what I wanted to show you. I was born the year after the war, and my mum's kitchen had one of those, and one of these, and one of these. It feels like home when I was a little boy, except the one thing that dominated the kitchen in those days was rationing. Did you have rationing we over here? We had a lot of rationing here. We had, from 1942, and for petrol, and meat, and sugar, and tea, and butter, so there was quite a bit of rationing in Australia, yeah, from 1942 onwards. Rationing was primarily designed to ensure a fair distribution of essential goods, namely food and clothing. Back then, ration books ruled. And this is one that we're very lucky to have. It's one that's for clothing, and a lot of people who sort of talk about the old rationing refer to the limited clothing that they're allowed to wear. No coupon, no clothing, and that applied to everything. Coats, vests, dresses, undies, socks. Even the most frugal mum, hey, this is the 40s, had to come up with some ingenious solutions. They tried to make their own nylons, didn't they? They did, and what they used to do was the women used to paint their legs with, um, with cold tea, so the stain of the tea would make their legs look a little bit brown, which is good here in Australia. And also, too, they used to obviously have pencil marks that would create the seam of a stocking. So uh, it, it was... wouldn't have fooled many people, no, would it? No, no. All right, now, you made a nice cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, am I going to pour all yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I'll pour for you, oh, thank you. You're my guess, actually. Was tea itself rationed? Well, yeah, tea was rationed, and you were only allowed half a pound of tea every five weeks. Yeah. So um, you really had to be very careful of tea. For the more metrically minded among you, two pounds of tea is just under a kilogram, and Aussies loved their tea. Butter started at about a quarter of a kilo a week, and sugar was about half a kilo. Homemade cakes and pickies were suddenly a luxury. Australia was helping the UK a lot for post-war development, and so meat was also sent off to the UK, which meant that Australians had to miss out on meat to try and um, help their help the mother country, so to be. Yeah, sorry about that, but it helped me grow to be the big <laughs> boy that I am. The war might have finished in 1945, but it was another five years before rationing finally ended. And remind me, who was the mastermind behind all that rationing? Yep, that person was Ben Chifley, who was our wartime treasurer and also minister for post-war reconstruction. So he put all those regulations in place. And that brings me right back to where I just began. The reason that this house is kept the way it is is because right through the war years and beyond, it was the family home of Ben Chifley and his wife Elizabeth. Look, there they are, nattering away on the veranda. Isn't it extraordinary that a man who had become the powerhouse behind Australian politics should still be living so modestly? But it was typical of the man. A no-frills, down-to-earth country fella. The sort of bloke the nation could trust to carry out the job of post-war reconstruction. Chifley instigated the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme, the development of the iconic Holden car, and radical new welfare programmes. But the initiative that had the greatest impact, and still has a massive impact today, was his post-war immigration policy. And Bathurst had a very big part to play in that. This vast, empty space just outside Bathurst in Kelso may not look much, but between 1940 and 1952, it looked like this. Blokes like that would have lived here. 
But when the soldiers left in 1947, it became one of Australia's major migrant reception centres. And in the four years up to 1952, 100,000 migrants would have been processed in those buildings. They may have been known as refos and wogs back then, but these refugees from a battered and beaten Europe were the start of the multicultural Australia we know today. That post-war immigration was the country's biggest social phenomenon of the 20th century. The camp closed more than 60 years ago, but its legacy lingers on. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Hello. Nice to see you both. Thank you. You're welcome. You arrived at the camp one dark night in the 1940s, didn't you? Yeah, that's right, 1949, 20th of July, very frosty night. But at first light, I remember my mother went out to have a look where we were, and she was shrieking <laughs> with horror to think that these dead trees, she'd never seen eucalyptus trees before, everything was dry, and she said, OK, we're going back before the ship leaves the harbour, we're going back. And went straight to the authorities, yeah. the office, and they arranged, uh, calmed her down and arranged her to come and see Bathurst. And once she saw Bathurst was a city and there was civilisation, she was much, much happier. Where had you come from, George? I came from Hungary. That's where I was born. And, uh, well, during the war in... Second World War in 1944. We just had to leave because the Russians were coming. Why did you decide on Australia? Well, because uh, it was an, and still is, an English-speaking country. And everybody was learning English in, in Europe after the war. So, by and large, how did people get out of the camp and start integrating with Australian society? Well, you see, uh, the migrants had to sign a contract to work for two years wherever we were put. It wasn't uncommon for families to be split. Fathers could be sent to work in another town or even interstate, and mums and kids were left to cope. How are you treated? Uh, it's uh, funny enough, you make friends. As a child, you make friends, but then quite often, the children would come back and some of them, not all of them, and say, I'm not allowed to play with you because you're a bloody bolt. To me, it sounded dreadful. Yeah. But years later, I found out it meant somebody was come from the Baltic. <laughs> Which you weren't really from the Baltic. You no, were from wasn't hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of miles away, weren't you? Yeah. So it wasn't just racist, it was totally inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but we were very much aware of how Australians were lacking in education in those days. Mm. It was a very, very different, a very isolated country. How long have you been here now? 64 years. And it's been very happy 64 years. We're very glad to be here. Mum actually loved it. And she had a famous saying, which I always remembered. She said, these people are really kind. I doubt if we would have been as kind to them had they come to our country. I want to hear plenty more stories like that at our road show. Hello, hello, hello. So I'm hitting the town to do some spruiking. We have a community day here. Sunday, round about 11.30, right here. Fortunately, there was a bit of a crowd. No surprise, really. April the 25th, Anzac Day. Small town style. Never mind the big commemorations in Canberra and Sydney and Melbourne. I think it's only when you come to a little Australian town like this one that you realise the, the full impact that war has had on a country like Australia in the last hundred years. Because this little ritual is, even as we speak, being duplicated hundreds of times throughout the entire land. 
And however you might feel about a particular war, or indeed about war in general, what you can't deny is the sense of pride, the sense of commitment, the belief in country that is engendered every year when all these people who made that commitment to fight get back together again to show everybody else what it was like. Given that this is Anzac Day, I thought I'd do a bit of recruiting myself. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, seeing you all here today reminds me of what it must have been like right here, right on this spot in 1915 when the Cooey March came past. You know about the Cooey March? Yeah, yeah. About half of you do. OK, the Cooey March took place in 1915. It was a recruiting march because what happened was after Gallipoli and after all the fighting on the Somme, the number of people who wanted to volunteer just slipped down and slipped down and slipped down. So there was a big problem. Where are you going to get your fighting men from? It started in Gilgandra, about 250 k's up the road, and the driving force was a plumber called Bill Hitchin. The idea was that, that as he moved from town to town, he'd get more and more people, come and join us, come over here, come and join us. More and more people came from Bathurst. They all joined in too. Come on, join in the march. All of you, come on, get in the march. That's right. Until there were about just over 250 people on the march, and we went all the way to Sydney. So come on, follow me, let's go to Sydney. And as they went, they were shouting, Cooey, Cooey, what were they shouting? Cooey! Beg your pardon? Cooey! Oh, come on, that's not going to impress anybody. What were they shouting? Cooey! Pretty soon, right across New South Wales and Queensland, Mobs like the Waratahs, the Kangaroos, the Currajongs and the Boomerangs were getting in on the act. Net result, about 1,500 new enlistments. What were they shouting? Can't hear you, brothers and sisters. Give it to me one more time. I heard this great story that they really got fed up with all the tea and cake that they got, and actually on, what they wanted was decent food. On the Cooey March, before they got to Blaney, they actually started to put petitions out saying, no more tea and cake, can we just have some stew? <laughs> um, they were fed up with it. Was the whole thing worth it? Um, from the point of view of recruitment, probably not, because as you say, 1,500 people, not a great deal of people for the effort, but from the point of view of getting the, the home crowd behind the boys in Gallipoli again after the deaths in Gallipoli, it was uh, probably worth it. I'm, uh, I'm going to go off and do my next story now, but if you guys would like to, to march to Sydney, that would be really helpful. See you. I know wars do strange things to people and places, so I'm not surprised when I hear about soldiers turning strolling players and snobby generals and suicidal POWs coming to this part of the world. But the final stop on my tour of duty really does take the cake. Look, this is the central tablelands of New South Wales, for goodness sake. The last thing I ever expected to see was this. Look, pure Scottish baronial mansion. Mad or what? Mind you, it does have a link to World War II. Chris. G'day, Tony. Hey, good to see you, mate. This house is quite spectacular. Is it modelled on something Scottish? Yeah, it is. It's pure Scottish. It's from the Scottish Highlands, really. That It was built by James Horne Stewart. So there's the clue, you know, an ancient Scottish family. But it's in such good nick. Yeah, my parents bought it when I was six years old and it had been shut down in the 1920s and we came along 50 years later and began a big project to restore this. So what happened to it between the 1920s and your refurbishment? It went to sleep, really, for that whole middle of the 20th century, but occasionally people came and went and during the war the Australian Women's Land Army girls came and occupied this extraordinary baronial mansion. The Australian Women's Land Army wasn't a fighting force, it was a workforce. City girls with little or no knowledge of life on the land co-opted onto farms to combat chronic labour shortages. 
Another really dramatic room. When the land girls knew they were coming here, they must have thought they were going to have the best war ever. I think they did, and from the gates, they probably saw a romantic, wonderful castle to occupy for the duration. But I met some of these land army girls, and they were telling me how the cattle trucks had delivered cattle to the sale yards and then gone to pick them up at the railway. So you can imagine what they were like, and they were all arriving in those conditions to what, in fact, was a very bleak and cold and slightly sad house. The days were spent picking asparagus for the local vegetable cannery. They harvested the stuff from sunup to sundown and then headed back to that bleak, cold, sad house. This is a huge room. What would it have been used for at that time? Um, well, this, I think, was the matron's office. So the matron? The matron. She was quite severe, too. In that first season, there were 90 19-year-old Land Army girls living in this house. So the matron needed to be tough, I think. It was a Spartan existence, nothing like the idyllic life of the government propaganda. But it wasn't all small green veggies overbearing matrons and... That's out of nine, ladies! You've got to remember that they were all 19 years old. Yeah. And uh, if you have a look up here, look, there's a bullet hole in the window. See that? Yes. Tony, that was my bedroom when I was a little boy, yeah. and I thought it was fantastic, you know? That was the ultimate thing to have in, in your bedroom window, a bullet hole. And I never knew why it was there. Um, and we always decided to preserve it. And then years went by, and we staged a big reunion of Land Army girls here, and they all arrived, and one of those 78-year-old Land Army girls jumped out of her taxi and she said, oh, Chris, is that bullet hole still in the window? And she meant that one and then told us the story. Which was what? Well, they had a party. It was November 1942. Uh, they invited a whole lot of soldiers from the Bathurst Army camp who brought a brass band uh, and they all danced on the ground floor of the house for the whole night, except that at midnight, these soldiers got all those girls out here into the courtyard and did a rifle shooting demonstration as an activity. And apparently one of the girls grabbed the rifle and said, oh, I know how to shoot, and put a shot through the window. <laughs> you know. So they really were quite larky sometimes. They were, they were very naughty girls. You can almost hear them now. Thanks, mate. Thank you ever so much. Bye-bye. When the war ended in 1945, so did the AWLA. They were never officially given war service status, and so the Land Army's hard toil went largely unacknowledged. But that's not the end of the story. The women wanted to be recognised and they were going to keep on agitating until they were. And in 1983, the Army finally relaxed its regulations and from then on, women like these who'd been in the Land Army were allowed to march with the other veterans on Anzac Day. If the Australian Women's Land Army were ever going to make a return trip to Bathurst, now's the time. There's a road show to be held and stories to be told. So I'm off to Makati Park. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have three hearty cheers for Sir Tony Robinson? Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's great to be here. Uh, Bathurst, I said that this at the very beginning of the show, is the sort of place where outsiders come in and create a big hullabaloo. And I'm proud now to be on that illustrious role. But we've, we've had a really good time here over the past week. Lots of fantastic stories. We came here on Anzac Day and I thought that what you did here was so appropriate to this town. I thought it was the perfect remembrance for those who fell in war in this town, and thank you for letting me share it with you. But I've got one other thing to ask you for, is that this afternoon, please tell us all your stories and show us all your stuff, because that's part of the show we always look forward to most. So uh, I'll stop nattering and... Let's get on with the show! Yeah. Lauren, 
Chris, this really is great. Will you explain what this is while I show it to everybody? Absolutely, Tony. That is a cap that was worn by one of the Japanese POWs who broke out from Kara on the night of the breakout back on the 5th of August 1944. What's the story of finding it? Well, there was a, a local couple, uh, Hazel and Norman Preston, were driving into town behind a truck that was carrying a couple of Japanese prisoners of war who'd been recaptured. Yeah. This cap blew off the head of one of those Japanese POWs. <laughs> they saw it by the side of the road, but they didn't know whether they should pick it up because they were afraid of getting Jap germs. Jap germs! <laughs> <laughs> so she got a stick, picked it up with the stick, took it home and put it in the copper, the big vat of boiling water that you used to use for washing and so on, and boiled it and boiled it and boiled it till all the colour went out of it. <laughs> so what used to be maroon ended up denim like that. And was that colour? That was the original colour. <laughs> <laughs> well, no germ was going to have survived that, was it? Not a one. And is that jacket from the camp as the well? The jacket is from the camp, but you see, the Japanese didn't like this colour, and they probably knew what they were going to do if they did get out with them, so they themselves used to boil it. So the fact that Hazel boiled that, it wouldn't have been the first time that it had been in the hot water. So this really had been boiled efficiently, hadn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Good on you, Tony. Thank you. I'm here with Peter Dowling, and Peter, you brought along this slouch hat from the Second World War, which belonged to your father. Yeah, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Now, when I saw this, I realised that your father was a member of the 2nd 17th Battalion. That's right. And he served in Borneo. And you've also brought along what? Japanese water bottle. What, what actually happened was they encountered the Japanese patrol. A firefight ensued. And... And your father walked away with a water bottle. And fortunately, he yeah. was a survivor and this gentleman wasn't. Yeah. Now, I'm pretty sure I know where this was. It was somewhere on the mainland of Borneo in the middle of 1945. Uh, the 2nd 17th liberated Brunei town, now Bandar Sari Begawan, right. uh, and then advanced down the coast of Borneo. So at some point in that, uh, in that struggle, they would have encountered the Japanese. And I'm just realising there's some Japanese characters here. This might be an outside chance, but does anybody here speak Japanese? Uh, I do. Ah, come in. Oh, I recognise you. You're on the coffee cart. Yes, I was. <laughs> yes, I am. How do you do? I'm Peter. I'm Sayoko. Hello. Nice to meet you. Sayoko, can you read any of these characters? Okay. Um, there are four characters vertically. The first one seems to be a kanji character, meaning middle. Yeah. Third one and fourth one put together. It looks to be a um, very common family name, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps Mr. Kozuka. Kozuka. Yeah, to oh. me, it looks like Mr. Kozuka's. So how does this make you feel, holding um, a relic of Japan's war? Yes, yes. A personal story was my grandfather was involved and he was at the wrong time, wrong place. He was executed in um, Celebes Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I am in Australia for 21 years. And um, first few years I came to Australia, Anzac Day was always a bit difficult experience for me. Mm -hmm. And now I am holding this mm. very old water bottle with the um, bullet hole. It's a very strange feeling. Indeed, yes. yes yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. So there you go, Peter. There's the story that, that this is probably the characters that signify the name of the soldier called Kozuka from the Imperial Japanese Army. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. The New South Wales town of Bathurst is a little quiet today because everyone's flocking to the Tour of Duty Roadshow in Makati Park. Les Moorhead, and um, his, his life was actually... Hey, Alan. Who's Hello. Who's that in the photo? Oh, well, this is Trooper Les Moorhead, and he was um, in the 12th Light Horse, and... And he was related to you? Yes, he was my uncle. His life was saved, actually, just by this penny. What happened? And it had been given to him just by his girlfriend, who he later married. He was shot. It was in his pocket. He said at the time he didn't really feel any great pain, but he got the biggest bruise that he ever had, the size of a plate. And what's the book? And they're things that he wrote. 
Uh, this is what, a Gallipoli, presumably? Yes. He says here, where we could, we buried the dead. I found one of my mates and buried him as decent as I could, as I was in some pain. I later wrote to his parents to tell them the details. I wanted to say more, but thought it best not to. We had to be careful when digging graves, or a sniper would get us, or we could be sprayed with machine gun fire. It was a crook end for many, as we had to leave them to rot. Very vivid, isn't it? A beautiful it piece of writing. Oh, thanks for sharing that. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. One of the great things we've been able to do on this show is not just tell stories, but to link people up with memorabilia that is important to them that they might have thought had gone missing. And we wouldn't be able to do that without you, Gary, and your organisation, Medals Gone Missing. How did you start it? Uh, look, we started back in 2008. It was a, a case that I've been looking for my own family's missing items for well over 30 years to, uh, to no avail. So uh, I found I needed a way to try and uh, find these items, track them down, and in the modern world, the internet helped out, so uh, Medals Gone Missing was born. But it's not just medals, is it? No, correct. It's basically anything which uh, may be pertainable to a certain man. Could be uniform, uh, items of equipment, for example. Uh, in fact, I've got one item here to show you. Go on, show us what you've brought today. What I have here uh, is a water bottle, and the water bottle was made in 1916 in Brisbane. Yeah. And uh, the thing that jumped out about this water bottle was that it actually had a number of names uh, written on the, uh, the actual shoulder piece itself. So um, do, do all these names imply that it was owned by lots of different people? Well, indeed it does. In fact, I've just copied up some uh, names here yeah. which are on the, the water bottle itself. The first name, which is quite hard to read, is a name by the name of Keith Cray. So after it's left Mr Cray, who uh, discharged in 1941, it's gone on to a, another man by the name of uh, Burnham Fletcher. So after that, it fell into the hands of a man by the name of Ralph Lindsay Harden. And of course, that's the name uh, which I'm most interested in today because uh, we placed this water bottle on our website and uh, a period of time later, I received an email from a lady who uh, claimed to be his daughter. You received an email from Jennifer. Come over here, Jennifer. Thank you. So how did you find out about this? Well, it's rather funny, actually. I was a bored at work one day, so You were I... bored? Yes, yes. <laughs> a bit bored at work. So I decided to Google my father, which was a bit odd because he died in 1986, but I did, and his name came up on the site Medals Gone Missing, and I thought this is very intriguing because I knew he had all his medals, and then it came up about this gorgeous little water bottle, which has quite an interesting history in itself. And so, are we able to give this water bottle to I'm Jennifer? I'm very pleased to say that uh, this water bottle will be returned to Jennifer today. Indeed, it will be. And it's going to be a, a great reminder of your father Absolutely. and his service. yes. Who's going to do it, you or me? I'd like you to do it, Tony. You oh. do the honours. Ladies and gentlemen, we now return this water bottle to Jennifer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you all know about the Cowra breakout, don't you? Well, I don't know if you were aware, but as well as all the Japanese in the Cowra camp, there are a lot of other nationalities, including, what, about 50% Italians? Yes, going? 50%. I kind of get the notion that although the Japanese were very angry and felt very humiliated, I don't get the feeling that the same emotions were generated among the Italians. I think they were a little bit more relaxed. Uh, they were allowed to work on the farms. Uh, they sang, they drank. They uh, were able to make their own grappa, in secret, of course, uh, in exchange for meat by the Australian guards. So what have you got here? This is a what they call a secret box. Can I demonstrate? Please do. OK, so when you pick it up, you actually can't open it up. It's just a, it seems to be a solid object. But we move it across like this. We take this little piece out. We slide that back across. That then falls out. We press a button, we open it up. 
Wow, that's great. <laughs> and inside, we have a ring. What's the ring made out of? It's made out of a two shilling coin. Do we know who got it? Yes, Clem Hill, and it has CH engraved on the front. Have we any idea who Clem Hill was? He was a guard. So it was, it was made a, present a present given to a guard? Yes, yes. Thank you. Have you seen that? The great thing for me about a show like this is it's not just about finding stories or telling bits of history. It's about links. It's about linking people together, people finding things that are important to their family that they had believed were completely lost. And that's epitomised this week for me by, by Jennifer and this wonderful water bottle. What a lovely find gorgeous, this is. Isn't it? But the other thing about this show in particular is I don't know how long you remain an outsider in Bathurst, but I've been here for a little bit less than a week, and already I'm starting to feel an insider. Is that for me? That's for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Bathurst. Thank you. Yay! Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.